Thank you for joining us today. I'm Carrie Bourne. I'm from the Office of Continuing Education at UW-Whitewater, and we host the Fairhaven Lecture Series here at Fairhaven Senior Services each semester. Uh, each semester, we focus on a theme. Sorry, long hair. Um, we focus on a theme, and this semester, we're taking a closer look at World War II. We've had some excellent um, lectures uh, over the past couple months, and we have lectures through the end of April every Monday at 3 o'clock. And today's presenter is Dr. Molly Patterson. Patterson. She teaches Middle Eastern and Islamic history at UW-Whitewater. She speci specializes in the pre-modern history of Islamic sectarianism in the Arabian Gulf. She has lived and studied in both Oman and the United United Arab Emirates under the auspices of the Fulbright program. Her research languages are Arabic and Urdu. Please welcome Dr. Molly Patterson. Thank you so much and thank you for inviting me. I'm so excited to be here and thank you Carrie for organizing this fantastic lecture series on the importance of World War II and its legacies. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about World War II and the creation of the modern Middle East as we know it today. I feel very strongly as a historian of the Middle East that both World War I, World War II, and the ensuing Cold War has done more to shape our world today than almost any other three events in human history. World War II saw the breakdown of the colonial world system, a system that primarily benefited Western Europe throughout the first half of the 20th century. My talk is going to focus primarily on the creation of the State of Israel, perhaps the best known of all Middle Eastern hotspots, in the modern political landscape. This talk is an examination of the collapse of European imperialism, especially under a system called the mandate system. And if you've never heard of the mandate system, don't worry, I'll explain it to you fully when we get there. Um, it's an examination of the collapse of the mandate system implemented by France and Great Britain in Greater Palestine and the subsequent establishment of the State of Israel on May 14th of 1948. So if anyone here has studied Israeli history at all, at all, you know that Israel was established on May 14th and then went to war the following day with its Arab neighbors. So I'll, t I'll contextualize that a little bit in this lecture. My talk is organized in three sections. First, I'm going to talk about the idea of Zionism, which is a very complex idea because it means different things to different people. Then I'll talk about mandate imperialism and some of the post-World War II politics in the region that were directly impacted by the collapse of European imperialism. Although international support for Holocaust survivors certainly influenced the creation of the State of Israel, it was by no means the only contributing factor to Israeli statehood. Many people, I think rightly so, have very strong emotions about Israel and Palestine. My intention as a historian is to present a compassionate, objective, and informed approach to this very sensitive topic. The goal of my talk is not to debate the legitimacy of either Israel or Palestine nor is it to pass judgment on the nuances of any particular political or religious ideology. Instead, I am simply using Israel-Palestine as a case study in order to illustrate the direct impact of the collapse of European mandate imperialism 
in World War II in the Middle East. So to that end, because I actually I love debate and I, lo I teach a course on, on Arab-Israeli politics, I thought I would share some resources with you if you're interested in, in pursuing this topic a little bit more. Um, one of the, the best resources I've found for people who are interested in some of the controversies surrounding Arab-Israeli politics, particularly in the modern world, is a online podcast called Intelligence Squared. And as you can tell, they put in some very, very controversial topics. Here we have um, two prompts. One is a democratically elected Hamas is still a terrorist organization. So there, there is a, a group that's arguing for that and a group that's arguing against that in a very formal Oxford-style debate. Usually, they're high-level politicians, members of the United Nations, people who are very informed on these issues. Another prompt that they've done recently, the UN should admit Palestine as a full member state. So again, it's on all sides of the political spectrum, and people do a really good job in this podcast. And um, you can also watch it online on the computer. Um, they do a really good job of presenting clear empirical evidence to support their lines of argumentation. Um, I also would recommend these two books. Um, these are the books I use in my Arab-Israeli history class. One of them is the Arab-Israeli Reader, which is chock full of primary sources, speeches, UN resolutions, white papers that really speak to some of the most pivotal events in um, Israeli-Arab politics. Another book that is perhaps a little bit more accessible is a book called The Lemon Tree, which is by um, a fantastic researcher named Sandy Tolan. And it's the story, um, true story, of both a Israeli family and a Palestinian family that are trying to make their way in post-World War II Israel and mapping out some of the struggles that both families experience, the Jewish family in the wake of the Holocaust and the Palestinian family in the wake of losing their home. Um, it's, a, it's a beautifully written book and one that I feel really presents both sides of the story quite clearly. I'm actually really excited for the Q&A section of this. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about how I approach this as a professional, this topic as a professional. Um, I've made the professional decision to approach Arab-Israeli politics in a very specific way for a very specific region, reason. Um, I, I've decided to approach it in a way that really does not speak at all to my personal political feelings or my religious feelings at all. And I've done that through trial and error, through 10 years of trial and error. I don't always succeed, but I try my best to present primary sources and evidence so that my audience and my students can draw their own conclusions. Does that make sense? Um, to that end, I, re I respectfully request that in the, the question and answer portion um, that you don't ask about my personal political beliefs or my religious beliefs. If you want to talk about your own, that's you know, totally on the table. But I, just, I, I will smile and move to the next question. All right? <laughs> um, I have found that, particularly with the topic of Israel and Palestine, my discussions are always more productive when I intentionally leave my personal feelings about the issue behind. Um, I do my own intelligence squared type debates in my Arab-Israeli class. If I know one of my students well, and if I know they have strong political views, either pro or con Israel or pro, pro or con Palestine, I'll actually assign them to the side that I know that they don't support ideologically, so that they're, <laughs> they're sometimes not so happy about this, so that they can kind of draw their own conclu conclusions and learn the argument from the perspective of the other side. Um, which I think is really, really valuable when we talk about something that's so emotional for so many people. I do this so that they can open their mind to opinions that are divergent from their own. So I'm going to start with a question that on the surface seems like a super easy question, but it actually is a little bit 
more nuanced than a lot of people imagine. And that question is, what is the Middle East, right? What is it? What, what, is, what is common about people in, in the Middle East? What, are, what commonalities exist? Does anyone have any ideas? What are some of the common things that make somebody Middle Eastern? Certainly there, there are three different continents, right? People live on three different continents. They speak a number of different languages, Turkish, Persian, Arabic, Hebrew, practice many different religions, Islam, Christianity, Judaism. There are atheists in the Middle East. There are Druze in the Middle East. There are Baha'i in the Middle East. So what makes somebody Middle Eastern? Um, I am going to argue as a historian that the Middle East itself is a relatively new idea. It's a relatively new historical construct, and one that relies on a European definition of a modern nation state. It's really important to recognize that throughout most of its history, people that we now call Middle Eastern people didn't define themselves as citizens of Syria or Egypt or Lebanon, they define themselves according to their religious beliefs, their language, or their family or ethnic group. The idea of nationalism and a nation state is really a Western idea. It wasn't until the 19th century that many of the countries we now think of as Middle Eastern countries came to exist. The borders in countries like Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, and Egypt were drawn for them in a British Foreign Service office in the middle of the 19th century. So you have been talking about World War II in this lecture series. During World War II, the system of imperialism that we see in the Middle East, primarily British and French imperialism, begins to break down. Obviously, Great Britain and France in World War II suffered from tremendous damage to their infrastructure. Many lives were lost. The idea of controlling an imperial territory overseas was a real stretch for the British and the French who had already suffered the losses of both World War I and World War II. So to commit the number of people and troops to administer a colonial territory would have been both costly in terms of human life and costly in terms of financial burden. So during World War I and World War II, the whole imperial system had to be re-evaluated, not only from the perspective of Great Britain and France, but from the perspective of the people of the Middle East as well. So pretend that you are a king or a queen of a Middle Eastern country towards the end of World War II, you have some pretty weighty decisions to make about your own country. Are you going to follow your imperialists? Are you going to maintain your connection with your imperialist power? Are you going to rebel against your imperialist? Or are you simply going to wait it out and see what happens? Most Middle Eastern countries in World War II made the decision to wait it out and see what happens. Now, it gets complicated when the Cold War hits in 1945, right? Because now there is even more decisions to make. Are you going to be a first world country? Are you going to be allied with the United States and its allies? Are you going to be a second world country? Are you going to ally yourself with the Soviets? Or are you going to be a third world country and go about things on your own? 
Those are all designations that actually came out of the early Cold War period. Adding a level of difficulty to that, if you're a king or a queen of a Middle Eastern country, do you want to join the Westerners who had imperialized your country, sometimes for hundreds of years? Or do you want to join the communists who, as I'm sure you all know, took a very dim view of religion and religious diversity, right? So for religious people in the Middle East, this was a very difficult decision to make. So I am going to turn now to the idea of Zionism and how did Zionism kind of play into this picture of how Middle Eastern countries and particularly the state of Israel began to define itself in the light of World War II politics. As I mentioned before, Zionism is a tricky term because it means different things to different people. And I thought I'd break it down in um, a three-part way. So first, I'm going to start about uh, talking about how Zionism is actually a religious term. So this is religious Zionism, one form of Zionism, religious Zionism that is deeply tied to both Jewish and Christian belief in God's covenant. Um, this is probably illustrated to my eye best in Psalm 137 from the book of Psalms. Um, if you're not familiar with this psalm, you'll probably recognize it. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat and wept as we thought of Zion. There on the poplars we hung our harps, for our captors asked us, for songs, our tormentors for amusement. Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How can we sing a song of the Lord on alien soil? If I forget thee, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue stick to the roof of my mouth if I cease to think of you. If I do not keep Jerusalem in my memory, even at my happiest hour. Remember, O Lord, against the Edomites the day Jerusalem fell, how they cried, strip her, strip her to her very foundations. Fair Babylon, you predator, a blessing on him who repays you in kind for what you have inflicted on us, a blessing on him who seizes your babies and dashes them against the rocks. So this is the idea that Jerusalem and the surrounding territory was promised to the Jewish people in a covenant that was given to them by God, and it is an unassailable covenant. So I would describe this as religious or orthodox Zionism. The word Zion itself comes from the name of a hill that is right outside of Jerusalem. There are also other forms of Zionism. So I'm going to um, just skip the next slide. It just sort of depicts my psalm that I just read to you. Um, but I see that, as always, I'm talking more than I thought I would. Um, so I, I, I want to make sure that I get to all of my points. Um, the second form of Zionism I would call secular Zionism. And secular Zionism I described to my students simply as the idea that Jewish people need a safe place to live, work, and raise their families. Particularly in light of the rising tide of European anti-Semitism that really originated in the Middle Ages and started to re-emerge and rear its ugly head in the 19th century. You see Jewish visionaries like Theodor Herzl, who himself was not particularly religious. He was a culturally Jewish, but he was much more of a, a secular, uh, sec he had m many more secular ideas about Judaism, start to argue that Jewish people needed a homeland, he called the first Zionist Congress in 
Basel, Switzerland. And there was a real debate about where this Jewish homeland should be. Should it be in Alaska? Should it be in Uganda? Um, and finally, the, you know, this idea of Israel started to resonate more and more, and again, because of its religious connection to Judaism and to God's covenant. Now, the last part of my definition of Zionism, so we have religious Zionism, people feel pretty comfortable with that. We have secular Zionism, which is the Zionism of people like Theodore Herzl, who were arguing that Jewish people needed a safe homeland, right? Even before World War I, he was arguing this. Um, the last idea of Zionism is probably the most controversial one. The last idea of Zionism is the idea of Zionism as a form of apartheid. This is a form of Zionism that most Palestinians take, and most people who support the Palestinian cause take this idea that, in fact, Zionism is simply another form of European imperialism and that it was an illegal seizure of land. It is a separate but unequal system in this perspective, this last perspective. Um, so uh, just to give you a little bit of background if you're not familiar with it, um, the U United Nations GEOPA partition uh, plan in 1947 that designated Palestinian and Jewish land within the modern state of Israel. Now, um, this particular partition plan has not always been followed to the letter of the law, and a lot of controversies about settlement have arisen from people debating the subtleties of this particular plan. So now we have three forms of Zionism, right? We have religious Zionism, we have secular or sort of practical Zionism, and we have the perspective of Zionism as a form of separate but unequal land use for Israelis and Palestinians, not unlike the Jim Crow laws in, in the United States, right? Um, so I want to move now to the second part of my talk and um, really point out this idea that Jewish migration to Israel was not simply a post-Holocaust phenomenon. There were aliyahs. Aliyah is, um, is a Hebrew word that means to go up. It's also an Arabic word, meaning the same thing. Hebrew and Arabic are both Semitic languages with a lot of commonalities. And um, there were different aliyahs or different groups of Jewish migrants heading to the state of Israel, really starting in the late 19th century. Of course, in the wake of the Holocaust, you see the aliyahs grow. So I was lucky enough to get some funding from my university to do some primary source research at the, the British Library, which is an amazing institution. If anyone's ever been there or has the opportunity to go there, I would highly recommend it, especially if you're a book nerd like myself. So I was looking at primarily war office records from Great Britain that described the formation of Israel. I was interested in British perspectives of, on Zionism, both British Jewish perspective and British Christian perspectives on Zionism. And I actually, I discovered something that really struck me pretty hard. The British weren't all that interested in Israel in World War II. They were much more concerned with another country that was east of Israel-Palestine. Can anyone guess what that might be? Even farther east than Egypt, it was India. Yes, they were interested in India, and they were interested in India because India was the most lucrative empire for the British. They were more interested in keeping India as a British colony than anything that was going on in the Middle East in World War II. It was, for the British, really a backwater of this whole show, right? Um, so I want to talk a little bit about mandate imperialism and how the collapse of British 
mandate imperialism has covered, um, has colored Arab-Israeli history. So in order to do that, I want to first define mandate. So a mandate is an authorization granted by the League of Nations. So for those of you who don't study a lot of modern world history, the League of Nations was like the um, grandfather of the United Nations. Um, it didn't have a standing army like the United Nations, but it was an international peacekeeping organization that was established after World War I. A mandate is an authorization granted by the League of Nations to a member nation to govern either former German or Turkish territory. So in World War I, Germany lost a lot of their colonies overseas, and so did Turkey. In fact, the Turkish Empire, you know, the Ottoman Empire completely fell apart in the 1920s. And the British and French charged themselves with organizing former Ottoman territory and organizing former British territory. Following the defeat of Germany and Ottoman Turkey in World War I, British, Asian, and African possessions were judged not ready to govern themselves and were distributed amongst the victorious allied powers under the authority of Article 22 of the Covenant of the League of Nations. The mandate system was a compromise between the allies' wish to retain former German and Turkish colonies and their pre-armistice declarations. Mandates were divided into three groups based on their geographical location. Class A mandates were former Turkish provinces in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Palestine. These territories were considered sufficiently advanced in the perception of the British and the French to work towards independence and the goal was that they would be fully free by 1949. They'd be fully independent by 1949. Class B mandates consisted of former German ruled territory in Africa, in places like Namibia, and in Asia, in places like Samoa. So in 1922, the League of Nations entrusted Great Britain with administering these Class A mandates and guiding them towards independence. Now, I'm gonna talk about three treaties, and when I say the word treaties to my students, a lot of them close their eyes and put their head on their desk, all right? But I actually think these treaties are really important, and they do a lot to explain why there is so much friction today in Israel. And I'm super lucky because these treaties are actually, one is in 1915, one is in 1916, and one is in 1917. So I'll start with the 1915 one. To add another level of ease to that, you can kind of tell who's who in these treaties by looking at the names. So one of these guys is British and one of them is an Arab. You can probably figure out which is which. The Hussein McMahon Treaty was a treaty in World War I that was made between the British under the auspices of Mr. McMahon and King Hussein of Arabia. If anyone's ever seen Lawrence of Arabia, this is what Lawrence of Arabia is about. The British promised Jerusalem and the surrounding territory to King Hussein in the 1915 Hussein-McMahon Treaty. So I'll say that again. The British promised Jerusalem and the surrounding territory to King Hussein and the Arabs in 1915. In return, the Arabs promised the British that they would drive the Ottomans out of Arabia. So this was a, this was a treaty. The British would give the Arabs Jerusalem and the surrounding territory. And again, remember, the British didn't really care all that much about the administration of Jerusalem. They were more interested in India in both World War I and World War II. And in return, the Arabs would drive the Ottomans out of Arabia. So has anyone seen Lawrence of Arabia here? Yeah, sure. 
King Hussein was successful, right? He actually did that. He drove the Ottomans out of Arabia. The very next year, Mr. Sykes and Mr. Picot, one is French, one is British. You can guess who is who, right? Mr. Sykes, Mr. Picot, made a treaty to divide up the Middle East into joint British and French mandate. So British and French zones of control. Do you think they got on the telephone and called King Hussein and told them what they were doing? No? No, they didn't. They didn't. So the Sykes-Picot Treaty is a year after Hussein McMahon. And the Sykes-Picot Treaty really divides most of what we now think of as the Near East, the Fertile Crescent area, into joint British and French mandates. Now, the very next year, we have the Balfour Declaration. So 1915, we have Hussein McMahon. 1916, we have Sykes-Picot. 1917, we have Balfour. Now, Balfour was inspired by our friend Theodor Herzl, who is rightly pointing out that Jewish communities in Europe were facing a rising tide of anti-Semitism. There were some pretty ugly ideas about Judaism and the Jewish population of Europe that were emerging in the popular press. And Herzl and um, Jewish visionaries like um, the Rothschilds were calling for the creation of the state of Israel. And Lord Balfour did promise that Israel and the surrounding territory would go to European Jews. So now we have the same little tiny tiny piece of land, little tiny piece of land, promised to who? The Arabs, the the French, the British, right? And European Jewish people. There's also a fifth group of people who are directly involved in this, which are the Palestinians who are already living there, right? So what is this a recipe for? Trouble. Is this a religious conflict, though, or is it a conflict over land? I mean, we very often, and I think one of the reasons why the, the Arab-Israeli struggle is, is so emotional for so many people is that it's, it's couched in religious terms, and, and people feel very strongly about their religions. Most Americans are religious in one way or another, and people really see this um, as a religious struggle. And Jerusalem, of course, is a sacred city to all three major Abrahamic traditions. It's a sacred city to... Um, Islam, to Christianity, and to Judaism. But at the roots of this, we see military struggles, we see broken treaties, and we see the failure of the mandate system come to a head in World War II. Now, I want to talk a little bit in my last few minutes about Cold War power politics beginning right after World War II and how the struggle for Israel has been colored by the Cold War system. While Cold War rivalry between the United States and the Soviet Union is frequently thought about in terms of proxy wars, particularly in places like Vietnam and Afghanistan, um, and subsequent Soviet and American interventions, the Middle East was an equally important theater of the Cold War. I would argue actually starting during World War II. I actually think the Cold War didn't officially start in 1945. I think it's, it was rooted for sure in, um, in World War II and some of the, um, the failed diplomacy between the United States and the Soviet Union, even though they were ostensibly fighting on the same side. Um, between 19... 45 and 1991, the Middle East really functioned as a battleground for resources and strategic alliances. And this fact has enormous consequences for us as modern people. Nowhere has the impact of the Cold War been more profound or more pervasive than in the newly independent state of Israel. The triumph of Israelis during the first Arab-Israeli war, that war that started on May 15th of 1948, is just one example 
of competition for regional influence and um, how this political destiny really altered the Middle East. As I study this more and more, I begin to see themes repeated. Themes like struggles for land, land ownership, increasingly for energy, and increasingly for water. I don't know if you've been following the news at all about the Golan Heights. Um, there is a real disagreement now, once again, <laughs> about who the Golan Heights should belong to. Should it be Syrian? Should it be Israeli? Should it be administered by an international consortium? The Golan Heights, for those of you who haven't studied this, are, is a very water-rich territory north in the north of, of um, what is now the modern state of Israel. Um, we see power politics fought over resources. And I would like people to keep their eye on the news because my projection as a historian, of course, historians are not fortune tellers. Um, w would that we were, we would drive a lot nicer cars, right? Um, <laughs> Um, but my, my projection as a historian is that the wars of the future are going to be water wars. And um, I, I really feel like um, this current struggle in Golan is um, probably one of the first real concrete empirical examples of that type of warfare. So in conclusion, once again, I wrote way too much. Um, in conclusion, my Arab-Israeli history students often joke that I keep repeating the phrase, it's complicated, right? It's complicated. In one way, it's true, it is complicated. Um, the importance of the creation of the State of Israel in 1948 after the genocide of the Jewish people at the hands of Adolf Hitler has forever changed the map of the modern Middle East. On the other hand, there are things that are not complicated about this. There is nothing particularly opaque or mysterious about mid 20th century Israeli Palestinian power politics. We see that the British had a major hand in the development of regional instability that came to a head during World War II. They grossly underestimated the importance that the creation of Israel would have to the modern Middle East. In addition, there was little attention paid during World War II to some of the most important security issues in the Near East, especially land and water rights. As we see today in the current question over the Golan Heights, which is a water-rich strip of land, politics and religion are again manipulated by politicians on all sides for the purpose of, a guard of guarding essential resources, and people's deeply felt and emotional religious beliefs are used against them from all sides. So I wish I could have a more cheerful conclusion, <laughs> but it's, it, you know, it's not a cheerful topic. And um, I would really like to hear how you guys feel about this, so, and, and to answer, if I can, any questions you might have. And I know you're going to pass the microphone around a little bit. Yeah, we can take questions now. OK, let me come to the front here just a sec. The three treaties that yes. you talked about, were these, are these basically repeal and replace, or are they all just kind of mixed together in a big bowl? Mixed together in a big bowl, for sure. Mixed, they, were, they, were, they, were, they were not repealed, and they certainly were not signed by all parties. Um, so again, um, this is really, a, you know, if you're going to write, like I like your bowl metaphor, because if you're going to actually write a recipe for a political disaster, you would mix it in that bowl, right? right? Do you think that the two-state solution to the Israeli-Arab conflict is dead or possibly will be re reunited? reunited? Um, I don't think it's dead. I, I really don't. I think that um, it certainly is, Is it like I'm going to say it again, it's complicated, it's, it's difficult, um, but I hope that it is not dead because um, as, again, I'm not predictive or anything like that, um, but as a historian, it really seems to be one of the more, and, and you know, again, I've done this debate with my students a lot, and that from the evidence that they've shown, it seems to be one of the more logical solutions. Not that people always follow the most logical path, but um, I don't know what another solution would be. 
Does anyone have other solutions that they think would potentially be? No, right? One state, right? One state, which, which it is in a way now, right? Um, the way I like to explain the Palestinian territories, particularly to my North American students, is that Palestinian territories operate almost like, um, like First Nation reservations or um, Native American reservations, that they're semi-autonomous regions within the state of Israel. So we all know that Gaza and the West Bank are currently run by Hamas, which the international community has condemned as a terrorist organization. And the West Bank is run by the Palestinian Authority. Um, and again, they don't get along themselves. So I think one of the big problems is that Palestine, Palestine and Palestinians don't have a united system of representation. I was really struck, I went to Jordan a couple years ago, and there are still Palestinian refugee camps in the Jordan Valley, a lot. And there's still people who are wearing keys to houses that don't even exist anymore. So, I mean, it, it, it is, these, these are deep-rooted historical scars. And one of the saddest things about this whole struggle to my eye, and I said I wouldn't get political, but here I am getting political, is that both sides have a point, right? Um, so you can understand, if you listen to them carefully, you can understand both arguments. And I don't know how that is going to be resolved. Uh, there was a conference, that was at Lucerne in 1923, that sort of settled, quote unquote, the post-World War I boundaries. How do all these declarations fit in there? And did that survive World War II, that 1923 provision? That did not survive World War II. I don't know exactly the causes of what made it fall apart. Um, my understanding, and again, this is a very sketchy understanding of that particular conference, is um, that it was inspired by the League of Nations. Um, and of course, the League of Nations, I think, lost a lot of credibility during World War II because of things like the war guilt clause and you know the, the German hyperinflation and all of that. So um, many of the treaties that were made under the auspices of the League of Nations lost a lot of credibility. I just saw recently where another 4,000 um, housing units had been authorized to be built in the West Bank. My question is, how long do you think that the land, the state of Israel, including the Palestinian area, can sustain as many immigrants moving in there as they plan for? Wow, that's a really good question and one that I, I honestly can't answer. I'm not, I, I think that would be, um, if you ever have anyone come um, talk about the ecology of the region, I think that would be a really interesting question to ask somebody that talks about sustainability, because I'm sure you all know that the environment in Israel-Palestine is incredibly fragile. Uh, it's a desert environment, it's a very, very fragile ecosystem and certainly overpopulation on all sides has, has damaged a lot of that land and um, certainly water as well. Since most of the countries in the Middle East are Arab, you didn't speak much of Arab unity or the Arab League and how that influenced the development of the Middle East. So many of the countries in the Middle East, an Arab is simply somebody who speaks Arabic as their first language. So the Arab League was a um, organization that actually was established after World War I um, that really s tried to unite Arab countries in the Middle East, again, Think of how new many of those countries were and how countries like Egypt, countries like Syria, countries like Jordan, and countries like Lebanon had not even articulated their political identity after World War I and certainly well into World War II. They hadn't decided, are we going to be 
a democracy? Are we going to be a monarchy? Are we going to be a theocracy? Are we going to be communists? Are we going to be democratic? These were debates that were going on in each one of these countries. And I think as a result of that particular phenomenon during World War I and World War II, there was a lot of disunity between the Arab countries. Um, particularly between countries um, like Egypt and Jordan, who took a very, very different view of nascent Cold War power politics. So the idea of a united Arab front becomes almost untenable. And historians will talk about pan-Arab nationalism. So you're really talking about a linguistic group. You're talking about Jewish people, because there are Jewish Arabs. You're talking about Christian Arabs. You're talking about Muslim Arabs trying to come up with their own national identity. And very often, there's strong opposition from pan-Islamism, which is a whole different group of people who are using a religion in order to forge their own national identity. So you see a real struggle between pan-Arab nationalism, I would say, represented by people like Nasser in Egypt versus pan-Islamic nationalism represented by one of the primary ideologues of the Muslim Brotherhood side, Kutu. So Arab unity becomes a pipe dream after World War II. I hope that answered your question. So I'm going to, did you have your hand up? I'm going to go here and then over here. You were explaining that, that the boundaries of countries was set primarily by European powers. To what extent do you think the, the uh, leaders of these nations today buy into those, de those, se those separations? Do you think they want to change them or accepting them? Um, I lived in the United Arab Emirates for a year, and they were st uh, United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Saudi Arabia were still fighting over the same oasis that they had fought over during World War II, D if that answers your question. The boundaries are not accepted. And again, think if somebody drew a line through Wisconsin, and you couldn't visit your aunt and uncle, right? And there are certain communities that were split off from one another. It's going to cause a lot of friction. There's, it's going to cause difficulties. Um, and you know, m most of, of the territories had seen themselves, like I said, they'd seen themselves as Ottoman citizens for so long that to think of yourself as a Syrian nationalist becomes a new identity. Nationalism today is very strong. You know, nationalism has not gone away. So I think in 2019, there is certainly a very strong Syrian national identity, Egyptian national identity, et cetera. But again, these are new articulations, or relatively new in the historical scope. I have a question about demographics. Sure. Uh, if I'm, my memory serves correctly, about 20% of the population of Israel mm -hmm. is Arab. Mm -hmm. And the growth of the settlements is gradually turning Judea and Samaria into essentially a de facto part of Israel as well. Correct. So you don't have to be a real good prophet to see that Jews will soon be a minority in the state of Israel. My question is, do you think Israel can be both a Jewish state and a democratic state? Wow, that's a really good question. Thank you. <laughs> yes. So can Israel be both? I'm actually going to use that for my debate. For Yes, I think that's, a really, that's one I, I really have to think of. Can it be both a Jewish state and a democratic state? Um, I certainly hope so. But again, I don't have the power of prediction. Um, right. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna probably have to get a used one at this point. Um, yes, um, I, I think it's, I think it's a really good question. Certainly, Isra Israel is a democracy today, although not all Palestinians would agree with that, right? So Israelis would say they're a democracy. Like again, it's like Zionism. It means such different things to so many different people. Um, 
that maybe maybe the question would be like, can for my my debate group, it could be, can Israel sustain its democracy in the next ten years? Right, looking at just a, like a short term projection, and th I think you could find better empirical evidence on both sides to build that argument. I my 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 best answer to that is I don't know. All right. <laughs> Other questions? Lots to take in. <laughs> These are great questions. I really appreciate yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well. There's one more right one here. One here? Um, I didn't catch. You said uh, Hamas is considered a terrorist organization. Right. But it's running the East West Bank. <laughs> it's it's running. Uh, it's not running the West Bank. It's running the Gaza Strip. The Gaza Strip. Right. And I I wondered. Oh, so Israel itself is doing their democratic thing, and Hamas right. is okay. It's like a semi-autonomous government. It was elected in two thousand and six. It was a smack in the face to the international community because the international community wanted Gaza to run a free and fair election, and then they elected Hamas. Okay. So how does the international community handle that? Okay, but right. so the Gaza is like a state in a in a nation, right? It, it's like um like a Native American reservation with its own well, leadership, and that would said. be Hamas, but within the rubric of a larger okay nation now, state. So okay. nobody has a Palestinian passport at this point, right? Uh, you have Palestinian papers, right. but since Palestinian Palestine is not recognized as a country right now. It would still be yeah. considered part of Israel. Yeah, yeah, I understand okay. that. But I've got to finally understand the picture. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> Any other questions? Yeah. The Middle East is so complex, and the average person in this country doesn't understand all the things that go on in that thing. Uh, I've heard in the past where if there was a third world war, that's where it would start at. Well, some have worried that the situation in Syria, since it's really looking more and more like a Cold War proxy war, would devolve into that type of a situation. But that's a whole nother lecture, so please invite me back. <laughs> and then I've also heard, too, with mm -hmm. all the sand they got over there, turned it into glass, and we wouldn't have all those problems that we have <laughs> faced. I don't know about that. I, I don't know if that's uh, the most ethical Public ethical opinion decision. would not go with that. No, no, I wouldn't go with that either. I think that is not very humanitarian. Time for another question. Anybody else? Okay, if you want to chat maybe briefly, um, Dr. Patterson will be here. But please join me in thanking Dr. Thank Molly Patterson. Thanks, everybody.